Music has never been more available, accessible, or abundant than it is today. Much of that is thanks to our digital age, but that hasn't translated into great news for all musicians. Miranda Mulholland knows the realities firsthand. She's an incredibly versatile and accomplished musician, record label creator, and festival organizer. And it's a pleasure to welcome her to our studio to explain. Lots of things, we wear many hats. I do. But I, I guess do. in this day and age for musicians, you have to. How do you balance everything? Well, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of time sort of organizing my time yeah. uh, in a day-to-day -day way. Um, but it, it, I find that because everything sort of flows into everything else, um, the label, the festival, my own work as a soloist and uh, in bands. Um, there is a marriage of all of them, so it, there's sort of a natural organic progression to, to my day um, where it does lead into all these things. But certainly, uh, scheduling is difficult. <laughs> well, I want to show people at home uh, you in your element as a musician. Let's take a look. But not in heaven, but on the sixth concession, we find comfort from the And there you are with Harold Fair. What's it like to be in that element, in your element, performing and singing? Uh, well, this particular band is uh, one of the best musical collaborations that I've ever had uh, over the course of my 15-year career. I've been a side person, so I've played with groups like Great Lake Swimmers and Jim Cuddy, uh, Alan Doyle, among others. But this one um, is a real equal partnership. So um, Andrew Penner, who is the other half of Harrow Fair, mm -hmm. Uh, he plays drums, as you saw, and the guitar and uh, everything else. And I uh, go through my uh, amp with my fiddle and sing. I mean, it's it's a really um, you equal, seem really happy, really equal partnership. Yeah, and, but you and, seem yeah. happy when you're making music. Oh yeah, there's nothing there's nothing better yeah. than than the actual art of performing. I find yeah. So with digital technology, we've all been under the impression that digitization has democratized the process for a lot of industries, including music. Has it? Well, that was the promise uh, when the digital era was um, on the forefront, and it has not come to pass in such a way. Um, the democratization, it, it sure people can make albums in their bedrooms now. There is a lot more available. We've never had so much content ever in the history of the world as there is now. Um, but unfortunately, that's just led to more middlemen rather than... Eliminating the middlemen. Well, exactly, right. yeah. So the middleman before was the record label. That was well, yeah, one of them, yeah, yeah. But and, now? Well, now instead of um, the record label, which actually has a foundation and an amplifier and something set up in order to get your music out there and heard, um, now there's just a flood of, of content as well and fewer tastemakers. I mean, we don't have as many people actually writing about music with any kind of education. Really? Well, look at all the art sections that are being cut from newspapers across the board. I mean, first they're taken from arts and now, and then enter entertainment, and now it's entertainment and sport. I mean, there just aren't as many working uh, journalists. Well, let's take a look uh, at the history of this digital disruption. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1996, the World Intellectual Property Organization had the copyright treaties drafted in response to increased digitization. In 1998, wow, Google was incorporated. 1999, Napster, another peer-to-peer -peer sharing services appeared online. 2001, the iPod is introduced, I remember this. Uh, 2003, <laughs> Apple opens the iTunes Music Store. 2005, YouTube is launched. And 2008, Spotify is launched. Um, how have these digital milestones changed the music industry? Well, we've seen a sharp erosion of revenue. So for the same thing that if, if I had created a song um, and worked with a producer to put it out, paid, paid all my musicians, paid the producer, 
um, the amount of money that I'm making now is wildly less than what I would be making 20 years ago before uh, the digital di disruption. And, and I'm not against um, change. And uh, the, the great thing, there are a lot of great things about the digital disruption and disruption in general. I think we need it in order to move forward. But, um, there's but you're making less money now because? Radically less money, yes. Because of uh, people are not buying music? or People are not buying music. I mean, we had the, or, as you saw, you know, Napster and pirated music. Uh, the value of music has gone down. People, even though people can have, you know, on your phone, you have any song that you want in the whole wide world for, you know, if you paid for it, like $9.99. Um, but we still have seen this, uh, the creators get less and less and less of this revenue. And how has this affected you personally? Well, it's been interesting because I entered the I entered the marketplace um, as a small business. I mean, every musician is a small business uh, in 1999. So a really bad time to start being a professional musician. But I was still seeing how the uh, how that come before what had come before me. So I was in parts of bands that had had the benefits of actually selling records and making making money from from their work. Um, and so I, I have noticed dwindling album sales. There's a marketplace that's just flooded with, with content. So there's an exhaustion. I mean, people talk about the Netflix uh, effect, but I don't see it so much as the Netflix effect, which means that people aren't going out as much because they can stay home. But I think it's a symptom of just being overwhelmed with content. So you don't know what to choose. You don't know what to choose. I mean, if you see that there's a concert going on at Massey Hall, or you can you could see ten other bands the same night. There's a comedy show. There's a, you go to a movie. There is sort of an exhaustion, I think, of just well, just stay home and you know and chill. Chill, yeah. <laughs> and you know that's it's too bad. I mean, I I, I think that um, you know philosophically that's that's challenging, and I think that that's sort of a, it's something that culturally we'll have to address, but. Um, but it certainly affects me greatly, yeah. But, but I think some people would argue that, you know, you have certain artists like the Drakes, the Justin Bieber, Shawn Mendes, mm -hmm. they've been able to take advantage of this digital disruption and actually probably been more successful than if it hadn't existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. So why does it work for some artists and not others? Well, the, uh, the way that the, the business models are structured with something like Spotify is it's based on market share. So if I put out a record, the same month as Drake, um, and my album was spun a certain amount of times or streamed on on this on this platform, uh, because Drake would have such wildly higher streaming numbers as a more popular and more mainstream artist, um, one would argue, uh, his per stream number would be higher than mine. So it's not there's not a general you know if you made a record and I made a record, our what we got paid would not be the same. And do you think too that um, you know in music there are so many labels, and I don't want to label your music, mm -hmm. but do you think that because Drake has played on pop radio that that, that benefits those oh, artists? Oh, of course. I mean, I, I just just in terms of being um, a more mainstream artist would benefit him. The way that the algorithms work, the more times you're played, the more likely it will be that you are played at random. You know, that's just how it works. Mm -hmm. So again, it's that market share uh, business model that puts the fringe, the niche artists at risk. And, you know, speaking as a niche artist, I mean, my first band was a totally unpopular jazz cabaret opera, you know, noir thing. Um, that's pretty niche. Uh, but, but I'm thinking it would, you'd be reaching a lot of different people because you have <laughs> so many categories, well, right? Well, you know, yeah. but uh, it's um, sadly not. To <laughs> it was, it's, it's in the past. But, um, but, but the thing is, is that, you know, the argument is made, well, you could reach the people who like jazz, cabaret, noir, those five people around the world. Yeah. You can now find them on the internet. Well, you can, but because it's a niche and it's being streamed less and less, the less it gets streamed, the less likely it is, y your ability to find those people is greatly diminished. And so the way that Spotify works mm -hmm. is that they give um, a certain percentage to the labels, and then the labels give the artists a, a certain percentage of that money? Well, it depends on uh, how it's how it, you're set up. So mm -hmm. myself, I have a, um, a boutique uh, record label, and I have 10 artists on my label. And um, I get, through my distribution company, they, they funnel the streaming income which is, a bit, is quite risible, um, to me, and then I give it to my artists. They take a percentage of it, the distribution companies. So that, that's the way that that works in my particular case. There's been talks of Spotify becoming a label itself mm -hmm. and therefore eliminating, eliminating the so-called middle person. 
Um, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, once again, it's sort of just creating another problem, I think. I mean, I applaud them for trying to make new content and trying to do something that um, we've seen the success of this with Netflix. Obviously, Netflix has been creating their own content uh, rather than using other people's content. But that in there lies the problem because now we have an algorithm-based company who is putting their content first. If you go to Netflix, what comes up at the first bar? All the Netflix. Exactly. Yeah. So once again, if you're a niche artist and you're trying to get your music heard around this you know, democracy platform, mm -hmm. uh, now you'll be in competition with Spotify-based uh, productions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once again, it's stacked against you. I'm wondering when was, um, you know, like back in the 50s and 60s, when I guess was it a, a resurgence of music, uh, people became, uh, there was so much music to choose from. What was it like back then? Were artists getting paid fairly? Well, I, I haven't got my time machine. <laughs> but, um, you know, but I, I have seen the results. You know, it's interesting. I just saw this amazing keynote by a man named Jonathan Taplin. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was talking about his friend Levon Helm, who was in the band. And uh, now this is a U.S. Obviously, some of the band were Canadian, but uh, Levon is, a, is an American citizen. And because of some of their laws that they had in place, um, he was not making any uh, res uh, revenue off of some of his songs that had been written. It was called the Classics Act before a certain time. Mm -hmm. So even though he had been in this very wildly successful band and written some of these amazing songs, um, after a certain point, he wasn't getting any money for them. And uh, this became a huge problem. He ended up, he got very sick and uh, couldn't pay his, his medical bills. And it got to a point where, you know, this legend couldn't sustain himself. And, and Jonathan, you know, was talking about this particular tragedy mm -hmm. uh, about how we're not taking care of our, of our artists. Uh, and this is through something like, like legislation, like just to have a, the Classics Act come into play in the U.S. And we have certain legislations here in Canada that are different but are, could be just as useful to pull that lever and help out artists now. Well, in Canada, um, we have something that is supposed to help artists, mm -hmm. SOCAN. Uh, what is SOCAN? A SOCAN is a collection. What they do is they, anytime music is played, they, uh, they identify who wrote it and they get make sure that the creators are being paid. It's a very, it's a very good organization. And you're a member of it? I am, yeah. Okay. And um, let's just take a look at 2017. Some good news and some bad news for SOCAN. Um, there were record revenues for it. 150,000 member songwriters, composers, and music publishers in 2017. Uh, total performing revenues in 2017 was over $350 million, a 6.4% increase over 2016. Internet audio streaming revenues hit $49.3 million, a 46% increase over 2016. Now, the bad news was the vast majority of SOCAM members who received payment for their stream music in 2017 earned an average of only $38.72 despite the growth. What do you think of that? Well, once again, that speaks to the market share question. So, um, you know, Drake did very well. Uh, weekend, the weekend did very well. Um, and and that's, that's wonderful, and it's good, it's good news. Uh, you know, our politicians are certainly making a meal of it. It's, it is good news. Um, we've also t had such a drastic drop-off in revenue. So to announce any kind of incline makes total sense because now we at least have some models like like Apple Music, which you have to pay for. They have no ad-based uh, subscription series. Mm -hmm. um, Spotify does have ad-based, and they also have subscription. And more people are hopefully subscribing. Mm -hmm. It's only $9.99. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing the majority don't. Well, the, the unfortunately, majority do not yeah. uh, as of yet. Their projections were um, off. They had hoped to have a lot bigger uh, subscriptions, uh, uh, subscribers, I guess, um, and they don't. Uh, the biggest, you know, the biggest problem in this particular landscape right now is YouTube, who pays the record lowest amount to songwriters. A lot of people would think that YouTube is um, is a great place to showcase new artists, uh, new creators. Why do you say that? Um, OK, so YouTube is, uh, is under, um, oh, my Google, um, is under uh, a lot of um, safe harbor rules because of our government, which, which means that it doesn't have to abide by certain tax laws. And it doesn't have to pay um, royalties to, to, a, to a certain extent. So what we're actually having here is 
a corporation that says that they are merely, as they call it, I think, dumb pipe, but it's sort of a just sort of the storefront window. They, they, they're claiming that they're just the window and they have no influence over what goes in the window because it's user uploaded content. Um, so because they can say that, they get, they get this safe harbor. As soon as they start to do something like Spotify, where they're programming streaming and they claim that they're sort of a broadcaster, they would have to pay those taxes. They don't. So um, right now, even though they now are generating content through those dumb pipes and suggesting things to you, if you go and you, you listen to a song you like, though something will come up next. Yeah. And so they actually are a suggesting service. So they're sort of going against what they said that they weren't going to do. And these laws are from like the 1990s, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these these things that we have in our Copyright Act and that we have that our government has put in place to help uh, start tech companies to make sure that they had footing in a new environment. Um, the environment has changed so drastically over the last 20 years. We really need to update them and take a look at who they're actually protecting. Because now we're protecting Silicon Valley and we're not protecting Canadian creators. Because when you think about it, if all creators decided not to do anything on YouTube or if uh, all companies said you can't use our stuff, what would be on YouTube? Well, exactly. But uh, they do. I mean, a lot of artists go and say, please take down my music, someone has uploaded it illegally, but it's whack-a-mole. Right. I mean, it comes down and then it goes back up again. So that's, that's a real problem. What are industry cross-subsidies? Uh, industry cross-subsidies, uh, we have one sort of big example of this. Um, it's the radio royalty exemption. And it was created, I think, in 1997. And it was for, you know, our country is so big. And so we've had all these little outposts of radio stations across the country. A lot of ma and pa stations that are kind of keeping communities together and, and making sure that communities have a voice. And they were being taxed uh, to having to pay royalties on their um, income that they made for um, any of their uh, ads uh, and, and, and revenue from there. So there was a subsidy uh, made, which was um, they only have to pay $100 in royalties on their first 1.25 million in, ta in ad revenue that they make. Jeans cost more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Under, yeah, I know. Um, which is kind of insane when you think about it now because the, most of those ma and pa stations have been bought up by our major media mm -hmm. companies. So now artists, your favorite artists, your favorite Canadian artists are subsidizing Bell and Rogers and all the big media companies because they're getting this tax break. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's just... What do labels think of that? Or is it just labels rely so much on radio to get music heard? Oh, it's, I, it's across the board that, that, that everyone agrees this is unfair. I mean, if, if this happened, if, if this was pulled, this lever was pulled by the government and they said, okay, we're going to take another look at this cross-subsidy and we're going to say what was fair in 1997 no longer is fair. We're going to pull this exemption or change it mm -hmm. or allow some of the, if the remaining ma and pa's to keep it, but yet... Not for the, the big, big radios. Yeah, the big, if there was some kind of lever pulled that would allow so many millions of dollars to go directly to the labels and to artists. So how do artists make money if, you are not, if you're not making it from uh, record sales and if you're not making it from these uh, streaming platforms? How do you make money? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. So <laughs> I, I texted, uh, I started a music festival last year and I texted a friend of mine who is a multi-Juno award winner and I wanted to see if he was available for the festival. So I just said, are you, is, are you available this weekend? And gave him the dates. And he's texting me right back and he said, oh no, I've been booked up for ages. And then five minutes later, I got another text and he said, oh, did you mean as a musician? I thought you wanted to rent my Airbnb. <laughs> oh no. So I, I know, so this is a Juno Award winner. And, and so he, you have to hustle? Like you have, have to, to hustle. I mean, once again, you have to wear a lot of hats and, yeah. um, and I even feel, though, I was very fortunate uh, for a lot of reasons. One, my parents really believed in music mm -hmm. and, um, and gave me violin lessons, you know, when I was four and really made me stick with it, which was, you know, very important and taught me the, the real benefits of, of live performance and, and, and music. But um, I also did get to see what the previous generation's lives had looked like. So a lot of the people that I play with um, had had a very different career um, leading up the first 10 years of their career than I did. Living, right. and, and so to sort of see, I mean, at first I thought, maybe I'm just not good enough. Mm -hmm. But I started talking to other friends of mine, and it was across the board. I mean, people that I thought were doing way better than me, mm -hmm. but, um, but it was a real, a real problem right now. And so the people that I actually want to advocate for and try to change some of these things is the younger people who are coming up now 
who perhaps they've had their band program cut in school. I mean, music education is so important. And those people who are trying to contemplate what a music career could even look like in this climate. And so there's you know, things that we can all do to help these young people actually be able to see a viable career in music. What do you think needs to be changed then? Well, I think the government does need to take some steps. Um, the radio royalty exemption is one. Um, there's another one that's actually really interesting. Who knew that copyright could be so interesting? <laughs> but um, so one is just a slight change in the wording on the Copyright Act. Uh, I myself played fiddle on the TV show Republic of Doyle. So whenever you hear a fiddle on that show, that's you, which is often it's me. That's all. That's and so cool. yeah, <laughs> and and so you know I did those sessions with a great um, composer and and went into the studio and, and recorded those. And um, now because of a tiny wording of what what it, a sound recording means, any time that 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 show is played and it's syndicated worldwide now. So I mean I've seen it in Holland, I've seen it in France. You know, Alan Hocko dubbed in French. So you get lots of checks? No, because <laughs> every time that's played, I do not get paid. The composer gets paid, but I do not, and the, and the actors get paid. But because of this tiny definition of sound recording in the Copyright Act, I don't, I don't get paid. How do you explain that to people? Because they, might, they must think that your music is on a television show that people watch around the world, mm -hmm. but you're not getting any money from it. Well, I think it's supremely unfair. <laughs> I mean, and, and, to, and to come down to such a small thing as, as a wording, you know, that, that's sort of shocking. And there are many countries around the world, I think 44 countries, that if I had performed that music in that country and it was on their air, and they, that I would be paid. So it's, this is not, you know, Canada is an exception. We're not, uh, we're not leading the charge here on, on fair pay. I know you're doing a lot of advocacy right now, but what keeps you motivated to keep making music in this climate where you're not being supported? What keeps me motivated is live performance and, and, and just the joy of performing and, and creating something that, you know, in this time of so much content, live performance is something that will never happen again. Mm -hmm. You'll never be in that room with those exact people on that exact day. And that energy is just unlike anything. I mean, I, I was addicted to it when I was a kid and playing, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Um, and that, that joy and that passion keeps me going. I love collaborating. Um, I feel as though, especially in this sort of siloed business approach of the Spotify's and these big uh, tech companies, mm -hmm. mine is a lot more uh, sort of thinking like an ecosystem. I believe that we all have a responsibility to, um, to incubate, to nurture, to educate. Um, and so, hence the festival. I mean, I went from having a little label uh, to starting a music festival because I wanted to employ my friends uh, and people I believe in and I wanted to um, get people who maybe hadn't been heard before in front of a bigger audience or an audience of people who didn't know who they were um, and celebrate together. What would you like to see uh, like for the rest of the music industry to do like the record labels, the radio stations and the streaming services? Well, I think the streaming services need to take a look at their business model. Um, right now, if you ask a Spotify, uh, employee and I, I keep picking on Spotify but uh, the, but uh, you know at least they're trying to do something mm -hmm. so uh, you know there is that and I'd say if you if you don't subscribe to a streaming service subscribe rather than just the ad based because it does actually help musicians um, but I think their their business model they say well I say whether well, what is your product and they would say my our product is Spotify well their product isn't Spotify their product is our music that they're using at unfair low prices. And um, so that, you know, to take a look at the fairness of that and actually what is their product and who are they serving. Um, Do you think fans realize that, you know, you just said that to for fans to subscribe mm -hmm. because you're supporting the artist. Do you think fans actually realize that, in, you know, I guess everybody likes things for free mm -hmm. and they're fans of the music, yeah. but maybe there's a disconnect as to realize the uh, what's happening with musicians because yeah. it's painted as if it's a really lavish uh, profession mm -hmm. and you know let me just take this for free it's, yeah. it's not like they're gonna miss it well there was I think there was a myth that happened around the time of Napster mm -hmm. where people thought well I'm stealing Britney Spears that we're going back in time here <laughs> um, and it doesn't harm anybody else because she's so rich it doesn't matter but the problem was what happened was all of those little arteries that went off to the niche the niche artists that those those record companies were supporting got choked off because they could no longer 
spend money on these niche artists. So yeah. suddenly the mainstream just got more mainstream. I mean, in the niche stuff, that's where the exciting stuff is happening. You know, you go to the Cameron House in Toronto on any given night and you hear really cool things on Transac. I mean, Toronto is an incredible place to hear live music. And um, and also the places that you can hear live music are also disappearing. Well, of course, with, with real estate prices and right. things. Yeah, it's yeah. another another challenge. Um, tell me about your festival. Well, my festival is in Gravenhurst, uh, first weekend of August, so the August long weekend. Um, my great-great-grandfather was, I, I obviously never met him. Someone asked me if I met him. I was like, well, let's well, just, again, I guess you go back in time. time. I know. <laughs> Wish I'd met him. My great-great-grandfather was this incredible man named Charles Mickle, and he started a sawmill up in Gravenhurst, um, which is, the town became known as Sawdust City because of this sawmill. And... Uh, Very was, rock and roll. I know. <laughs> and he also was the mayor, I think, two or three times. And when he was the mayor, he had this opera house built on the main street. And it's still there today. It's 117 years later. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the top 10 acoustics in Canada. And for him to believe in this more blue-collar town that the arts mattered, I think, is, is a real incredible testament to his vision. So um, You're carrying the legacy I'm forward. trying to carry the legacy forward. I think uh, this town is gorgeous. It's historic. Uh, there's a beautiful barge that was built in the 60s that's on on the water, on Gull Lake. And then you can go, you can watch the concerts. They have a whole series, a music series that's free every summer, um, every Sunday. And we've plugged ourselves into the series. So we have shows at the Opera House. We have a show on the music barge. And you can watch from your kayak or your canoe or the beach or the grass and, and hear amazing music all weekend long in Ravenhurst. Well, Miranda, thank you so much for being here. Thanks You've given us me. a lot to think about, <laughs> and I am going to subscribe Yay. instead of uh, taking for free. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.